there and welcome back to EE386. This is going to be the lecture for class number 10. So uh, in this class, the first thing I'm going to go over is more block diagram al algebra examples and that will be a continuation from last class and it'll also have to do with the homework question, uh, the very last homework question for homework set number four. The rest of this lecture is not going to pertain to the midterm, so I'll make sure to let you know if you want to stop the video at that point and pick it up later, okay? So, uh, and also when we're moving down here, the next the next couple topics, uh, I wanted to draw a fancy star here, so it became a super fancy star, uh, and then I figured, well, why not just draw some little funny things here? So we've got a sun wearing sunglasses and a Yoshi from uh, Mario and uh, Mario games right there. So the things we'll be going through, moving between the Laplace and time domain with respect to system model equations, and transfer function features, just so we can start talking about the pieces of the transfer function, what they're useful for, and what we do with them. I'm also going to mention homeopathic stability, basically just what it is. We won't go further in this lecture than just basically what it is. And uh, the case of insufficient outputs, again, not in detail, just mentioning what it is because we're finally at a stage where we can do that. Okay. All right, so getting started with this. So some more block diagram examples. So let's do an example. The simple system, let's say that we have a block G1 up here. It is getting summed with G2. And then we're gonna have this feedback H right here. Uh, so sensors are typically denoted as an H. Okay, so we're going to have our input R, and what we're going to denote is capital R, so it's R of S. It's coming in here, and we have a subtraction, and then the output goes into G1 and G2. We gather our output of the entire system on the side, and this will be Y of S. All right, so now the goal of this is to find GCL or G equivalent. It is actually going to be the same for this case, okay? G equivalent means that we are just making an equivalent block. We're just uh, finding that transfer function that we can replace that portion of the system with necessarily. It can be an entire system or it can be just a portion. Closed loop is a uh, a stricter definition where I am including the entire system. It is the closed loop system, the entire system that includes the feedback in that case. All right, so if you remember our procedure that we went through, we want to first label all the lines, write the equations, and then combine them. We will simplify those. I'm going to call that all one step, and we typically have four steps here, and then we will form our output over input, and that is our transfer function. Okay, all right, so let's get started and label these lines. All right, so I don't want to label anything more than necessary. So these are three independent lines out here. Okay. And I've actually drawn this a little bit strangely. Let's just make that the node right there. That's where I meant to put it. Okay, so what I wanted to point out here is that we will need to label this line and this line, but this is actually connected to Y of S. It's already labeled. We can, of course, write that again just to make it clearer down here, okay? But we don't need to assign another variable to it. All right, so we can draw, let's just use x1 and x2, and then on this side, we have x3 
which is actually all three pieces of that line. And then we have an X4. Okay, so now I've labeled all my lines here. So that's all done. And uh, let's write our line equations. So we start out at the end with the Y of S. So Y of S equals, and it is equal to whatever comes into the summing junction. So X1 plus X2. Uh, so now, I'm just moving along here, this line right here is Y of S, and you can really go in any order that you want, but you want to make sure when you are, the way you know you're done, you have your output and you have your input included in your equations. You also have as many equations as you needed to label, and plus the output, okay? So here, I expect to have one, two, three, four, five equations, okay? Uh, I won't need an equation for R of S because it's just here, right here, uh, by itself. It's a supply, uh, so it is a value, okay? Or a set of values, it, it's a signal, so. All right, so we have X1. We'll just do that one next. And X1 is the output of this G1 block. It has the X3 coming into it, and then this G1 operation takes place. Okay, so X1, the output, is actually X3 with G1 operating on it. Okay, we'll apply that same technique to G2. G2 looks very similar. We have an output of X2, and we have G2 operating on the signal X3. Alright, so again, you can do any order, just make sure you cover everything. It may be helpful to put little check marks or something when you know you've already written the equation. Alright, x4, we'll do that one next, equals y coming into this h block. So h is the operation, and y is the input to that operation, okay? And that produces this x4. Alright. So now we want to write the equation for x3 and that'll be our last equation. It should include R of S because we don't have R of S, the input to the whole system included thus far. So x3 is this output of this summing junction. We have the input R of S and we have a subtraction of x4. Okay, so it should be R of S minus x4. So now we have all of our equations written out. The next step in this case would be to combine them and then simplify. So I'll start with y of s. So y of s equals x1 plus x2. I can go ahead and make the substitution for x1. So I'm going to write g1 x3. I'm also going to go ahead in this case and make the substitution for x2. Just be very careful when you're doing multiple substitutions. In this case, it's very simple, so we'll just go ahead and do it here. All right, at this point I can stop and simplify, and so I can factor out the x3. So I've got g1 plus g2, and I'm factoring out x3 here. Okay, let's make the substitution for x3. We've got r of s minus x4. Okay, so we've got still our G1 plus G2, and then instead of the X3, we're going to have R of S minus X4. All right, the last step is going to be getting rid of this X4, so we want to make our substitution with the equation here. We've got G1 plus a G2, and then we've got R of S minus this H Y of S. Okay, so now I have made all of my substitutions and we are able to combine this equation and simplify it. So what we're going to have is Y of S equals, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, do the distribution here. I have a G1 R of S and I have a G2 R of S, and then I have a minus G1 H Y of S, and a, a 
plug in minus, in this case, there's still a negative sign here, g2 h y of s. Okay, so now what we're going to do is uh, we could go ahead and combine these terms because they both have the r of s in common. And we could also combine these terms because they have the y of s in common. Or we could just move these over. So actually, I think I'm going to do that instead. That would have been our next step anyway if we had uh, gone ahead and combined these together. So let's move these over. So we have y of s plus g1h y of s plus g2h y of s. And that's equal, and I'm going to go ahead and combine these to g1 plus g2 r of s. All right, so now let's go ahead and combine the y of s. And we've got 1 plus g1h plus g2h. Okay, I almost ran out of room there. Uh, g1 plus g2 uh, times r of s on the right hand side. All right, so now we are at a form where we can form that output over input. That is our transfer function uh, format. All right, so what we can do here is go ahead and divide through with the r of s on both sides. So that would eliminate it over here and we would have an r of s in the denominator over here. We'll do the same thing with this coefficient and we'll move it over here. So we'll have a g1 plus g2 divided by all of that stuff. All right, so that would leave us with our g closed loop. In this case, it's equivalent to g equivalent equals the y of s over r of s equals g1 plus g2 over 1 plus g1h plus the g2h. And you could go ahead and factor out the h in this case, by the way. And then you have a, a little bit less to write here. It would look a little bit more concise. But there's our answer, okay? So that's one example. Let's do another example. We've already taken care of the trivial ones, such as just a series connection or just a parallel connection in the uh, prior lecture. So we will stay away from really simple cases like that. All right, so let's do just one more example here. I'm gonna have a, a G1 that's gonna go into a G2. And then we're going to have this right here, where we have a G4, and my G3 is going to be back on the other side, and I will have a G5. Okay, these are going to be added together. They will produce our Y of S. And then I'm going to have this node here connected to an H right here. I'll just have one H. And then over here, let's go ahead and connect that up uh, through negative feedback with the R of S added in there. And uh, let's just say that the output of this comes up here and we go through, let's say we have G1, two, four, and five, let's put a little bitty g3 right here at the very beginning. Okay, so they're out of order and uh, we have some series and some parallel connections. We have two more sum junctions and it's a little slight variation, a little more complex than the three block system we were just looking at. Okay, so same technique applies. We're just gonna have more equations in this case. We don't wanna label anything that's already labeled because that's just more work for us. So y of s is here and y of s is also here. I'm gonna go ahead and label the x1, and it doesn't matter if this is x1 or x5, it, it doesn't matter. Just be consistent with your variables. So x1, we're gonna say x2, x3, x4. X4 is this line and this input line here. 
we'll have an x5 right here, we'll have an x6 right here, we'll have an x7 right here, okay? So I expect, in this case, to have an equation for every line except for r of s, because r of s is our input, it is what it is, we already have an equivalency that we can assume for this guy. We know what it is at all times. So we should have an equation for all the rest of these. So that means that we're gonna have eight equations. Okay, we have uh, x1 through seven, so that's seven, and then we have eight from the y. All right, so let's get started writing those equations. There's plenty of them. <laughs> y of s, I always like to start from the output, so let's start there. Y of s is equal to the output of everything that, from the sum injection, okay? This is actually just the same line as y of s, so we don't need to include that. We have x1 adding in with x2, okay? x1 plus x2, all right? Next equation, x1, that's the output of this g2 block. It has x4 coming into it. So x4 goes in, it gets operated on by g2, and that produces x1. So x1 equals g2 operating on x4. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and keep working back this way and then we'll take care of this line and finally this feedback. Alright, so x4 is the output of this g1 block. So g1 operates on the input x5. Okay, next one, x5 is the output of this g3 block which takes x6 as the input. So x6 operated on by g3 is x5. Okay, there we go. All right, x6. We'll just go ahead and take care of him since we're over here. x6 equals the output of the sum injection, which takes r of s and subtracts off this x7. All right, so let's come down to the second row here. We'll come back to x7. All right, so x2. x2 is g5, and that operated, operates on this input, x3. x3, then, is the output of g4, which operates on this input, x4. Okay. All right, so we have this last line right here. All right, so now x7 should be our last equation. x7 is the output of this h block, which operates on our output of the system y of s. All right, that's plenty of equations. So now the next step would be to go ahead and combine all of these guys. So here we have y of s equals x2 or x1 plus x2 so i'm going to go ahead and make the substitution g2 x4 plus the x2 which is here g5 x3 all right so now i'm going to go ahead and mark these off so, that, so i know i've used them already all right so let's make this substitution for x3 i'm going to go ahead and eliminate that so then we can combine the x4s and that is g2 x4, that just stays in place. And then I have this g5, which operates on the x3, which is g4, making the substitution x4. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and combine those before I go further with substitutions. I have g2 plus g5, and that also multiplies by g4. So we've got all of that and we factor out our x4. So now I can make a substitution for x4, and that is g2, so I'm just copying this coefficient down here, so that stays the same. And then we have x4, which is the g1 x5. Okay, so I made that substitution. All right, so I have x5 here. Let's make that substitution. <laughs> okay, so actually, Actually, just, just backing up, we have this equivalency, you'll see, for x4. And so we made that substitution. It's possible that we might run into that again 
we might have x4 again in the equation because you'll notice that x1 also includes an x4, okay? And we haven't included an x, we haven't encountered x1 yet, or have we? x5, one, okay. Actually, never mind. We made that substitution first. So that's why it's always a really good, <laughs> good idea to check off your equations. But if you notice something like that, um, you know, stop and check yourself because you don't want to get to the very end and then find that you have y and r and then some kind of uh, an x4 or something crazy in there that you haven't gotten rid of. That tells you there's a mistake. So that's a really good way to, to check. And uh, so you get a bit of live debugging <laughs> from this example I made up. Okay, so x5, let's make that substitution. g2, g5, g4, just copying that coefficient again. And then we have our g1 that stays place. x5, let's make that substitution. It is g3, x6. Okay, so now we mark that off, and our last substitutions are these two equations. Or did we make the substitution for x3? Yes, we did. Again, I need to I need to learn to mark those off. All right. Making that substitution for x6, we now have g2 plus g5, just again copying that coefficient. g1, g3, and now we make that substitution for x6. So it is r of s minus x7. So that's great. That's a great sign, cx7, because that is our last equation. All right, so I'm gonna write this line down here and then we'll carry it up to this empty space that we've left. Okay, so this line goes down here. And then we have a the coefficient again, we get we copy that and we have a g2 plus g5, g4, and that all gets multiplied by this g1, g3. Kind of looks like a six, but it's a g. And then we have the r of s term right here, and minus this h y. So now, examining this, we have our y of s equals all of this. We have y, r, and y, and the rest is just the blocks themselves, their, their, their operations. That's exactly what we want to look for. We don't want to have any of these x's or any of our other lines involved. Output, input, and block operations is all that should be in this final equation, okay? If that isn't the case, then there has been a mistake, okay? All right, so let's let's go ahead and make our substitution now, or, or make our, uh, let's see, uh, we will simplify this first, and then we will do our, trans our uh, division. Okay, all right, we marked off that last equation. <laughs> all right, even though we're not substituting anymore. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and multiply this out. Uh, we can actually leave this whole term on this side. What I want is to take this coefficient right here and apply it to this last term and then move that over here. Okay, actually I'm looking at this and I don't think we have enough room, so we're just going to carry it to the next page. Okay, so... We have y of s equals g2 plus uh, g5 g4 and that is multiplied by the g1 g3 and that is all multiplied by r. Okay, so now we're going to apply this exact same coefficient over to this h times y. So we have minus g2 plus g5, g4, g1, g3, y, uh, oh, don't forget the h, h is right here, uh, and then y of s. So do be very careful with your multiplication. And uh, 
always check yourself. <laughs> All right, so I almost dropped that H. Gotta be careful. And it's a really good idea to go back to the end and also check that you've got all of your blocks represented. They should all be there in the transfer function. All right, so we can bring this term over to this side now. We've got a y of s plus all of this term right here. So all of that comes over here. I'm just gonna write that because we're gonna recopy in a second. G2, G5, G4. G1, G3, and R of S. Okay, so we've got all of that right there. And now we would be factoring out that Y and then doing our division. Okay, and that's, that is our final step. All right, so we're gonna have one for this Y, factoring out the Y, plus the G2, plus the G5, now this is in parentheses, G5, G4, G1, G3, and then we have our Y on the outside. So we close both our parentheses. We have our Y of S right here. And then that's equal to all of this Okay. Now let's do our division. We want output over input. And we have this term right here divided by this coefficient right here. So we should have the G2 plus G5, G4, G1, G3, I'm going to close the parentheses, divided by the 1 plus G2, G5, G4, more G's are right, the more messier they seem to get. But uh, that is our finished transfer function. And this is GCL because we have actually closed the whole loop. This represents the entire system itself. Uh, so all of this is represented here. So we can go through and make sure that we have all of our blocks. So I should have a G1 two, three, four, five, and an H. Here I have a G one, two, three, four, five, and I've dropped my H. No, okay. So the H should have been over here and it should be right there. And then we divide through, it should appear right here. Okay. So if you're going to make a mistake, it is a good idea to catch it on camera, right? <laughs> but yeah, so that actually really helps to go back and, and uh, make sure. Because in, in a problem like this, now I, I kind of consider this to be a bit much for a midterm or, or a uh, test. Uh, it's, it's really complicated and it's very easy to make a mistake. Um, yeah, it depends on how much focus I would put on this, but... Uh, this seems a bit much, uh, too many blocks. So uh, something like this with the structure wall, it's, it's fair to show the technique. It's really easy to make a mistake. So do make sure you go through at the end, uh, count the blocks and make sure everything is represented. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna do one last example. It's gonna be very, very quick. And this is going to be just with an alternate output and input. So let's say we have a control block. We're wanting to have the subsystem go into a control block. Okay, so we've got a complicated system. We've got uh, some kind of an input and got a little mini system right here. We'll do something really simple like that. So this is not so much about showing the technique as it is pointing something out. All right, so my out my input to this system, let's say, is E of S 
my output is u of s, okay? So this is a control system. And so when you have a control block, and if you think about that standard configuration that we mentioned last time, so we have our plant. So the plant is really the process, and he takes all of the inputs, such as our control, and say we have a disturbance as well. So we're just going to have everything in the floss domain. So I'm writing W of S right here. And we have our U of S. So this is the control. We have our Y of S. Negative feedback. R of S, reference input or set point, whichever it happens to be. And error signal is right here. It's what we want. R of S minus what we have Y of S. So that produces the error system right here. This is the standard configuration that we have. Uh, we refer to this quite a bit. We mentioned it in last class. Okay. So uh, what I want to point out here is that the if we're dealing with the transfer function for the control system, the output is actually U. The input to the plant might be U. It might be an input somewhere, but it's an output of the block that we're focused on. Okay, so if I were to have like some process G1, G2, and let's say G3 right here, and I just wanted to combine those, my input is actually this error. Okay, so your output does not always have to be Y. It can be something else, and it really just depends on what you're doing. In this case, we're not doing a GCL problem. We're doing a, a G equivalent problem. So we're, we're combining blocks to make one super block, which we represent right here. Okay, now if I were to do that and I'm finding G equivalent, I'm gonna use my exact same technique that we were using above. And I would first label all my lines, write the line equations, and then I would combine them and I would get this U of S, okay? And uh, once, I, once I get the U of S, equals to everything else, I can combine them, get that ratio, the Laplace ratio, that's our transfer function, and I would get U of S over E of S, output over input, okay? It would be exactly the same kind of thing, okay? All right, so right here, I'm going to say, if you are watching before the midterm, then uh, you can stop right here if you want to. The rest of the lecture is not going to pertain to what's on the midterm. Okay? All right, and I'll see you next time if you uh, are <laughs> pausing or if you're choosing to continue on. The next topic is going to be moving between the Laplace and time domain with respect to the system model. So I do want to outline the function for this. We often start with a system uh, equation, a model equation. So let's say, for example, that I have a, uh, let's say, a third order system right here. And uh, I'm going to just say I have two terms. It really doesn't matter. Uh, let's put an alpha right here. Okay, so I am dealing with my process. I'm going to set that equal to R of S for right now. Okay. Oh, sorry. R of T. We haven't made it over the Laplace domain yet. Okay, so uh, we're over here. We have an, a time domain equation, okay? So this is the uh, a typical system. Differential equation model. It's in the time domain. So we're, we're looking at this, and what we want to do is go over to the Laplace domain, okay? So I will go from the time domain to the Laplace domain, okay? So that's pretty simple. We've done an example like this before, but anytime I have a derivative, I would place an S, the Laplace S symbol would represent derivation. So we can rewrite this really quick. Triple derivative should be an S cubed. 
and we'll have capital Y of S now instead of Y of T that's lowercase. We'll have minus alpha. Alpha stays the same. It's just a constant, a coefficient here. And then we have an S in Y of S again. Okay, on the other side, I just transform to R of S. Okay, so I've gone from time domain to Laplace domain, and that's fairly easy. Okay, if I wanted to take this a little bit further and I wanted to get the transfer function, we would just do our division. Okay, first of all, I'm going to group these y's. I want to try and simplify at any point that I can. Okay, and then now I can do my division. So y of s is system output and r of s is the input. Okay, so we have this kind of a structure. Okay, then plants, and then we have our y of s. Okay, just like that. All right, so we'll do our division and we get our g equivalent block, which is y of s over r of s, which is one over s cubed minus the alpha s, okay? So there we go, that would be our transfer function in this case, okay? Now, what if I have a transfer function and I want to go back to the time domain. You might be asked to do that. It might be desirable to do that at some stage. So what you're going to do in that case is actually just kind of reverse your steps. Okay, so this seems confusing at first. Let me write out an example and we'll go through it. We'll, we'll use a different system and then we'll go back to that original one. Okay, so let me say that I have, say we have a trick we have a transfer function, and I abbreviate transfer function as TF most often, um, as let's say S cubed um, over, we're just making this up on the spot, S squared times S minus one, like that. Uh, and let's, let's give it a, a capital K, let's say K sub P. Something like that. So this is our transfer function for our system, okay? And that again means that that is output over input. Okay, so that's our entire system. All right, so how do I go back to the time domain? It's actually quite simple. Knowing that we have the output over input, that ratio already represented, we can just do our cross multiplication and then we can work backwards. If we need to do a, a, an inverse Laplace transform, we can do that. Okay, so let's write this out. We have this Kp coefficient, there's an s cubed. I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this out. I have s cubed minus s squared on the bottom. And I know that this is output of the system over our input. Now it's not too terribly important what is right here, this R of S. I can always come back and correct this later because just a placeholder variable and you should think about that uh, as such for right now. Okay, let's do our multiplication. So we have s cubed minus s squared times the y of s term. And this, this actually should be an arrow, not an equal sign. Uh, and then we have our, if we multiply this through, kp s cubed r of s. Okay. All right. So we've got these terms right here. Now it's starting to look just like our first step here, okay? When we take it, take it down here, so now we just need to go the other direction, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and multiply this out just to make it a little more obvious. We 
just rewrite the right hand side because that hasn't changed. Okay, so now I can go back to the time domain. Since I, uh, doing the Laplace, uh, the inverse Laplace transform for just an S term or an S to some power term is pretty trivial because we, we know that uh, 1 over S equals integral and that S equals D dt. Okay, so we know that. So now we can just write y triple dot of t minus y double dot of t equals this kp, because that's a constant, it's a coefficient right there, bar triple dot of t. Okay, how about that? We just went right back to the time domain. Now say that this wasn't R of S. Say that it was actually, this was not the entire system, that we didn't supply R of S right in. Uh, that we actually have this kind of a one piece of, uh, let's see, we'll say this GP. Skipping ahead a little bit. <laughs> that this is one piece of our uh, co uh, uh, um, system right here. This is our uh, standard configuration system. So this block right here is actually this GP block right here, this point block. Would that change anything at all with respect to our transfer function and going before, going into the time domain and back to the Laplace domain? No, not really. So remember when I said this is really symbolic? We could just make the substitution, since we've already figured this out, we could make that substitution as u. Okay, so if that's the input, this, this r in this case, I just happen to choose r, but uh, r is just the input to this block. Okay, so in this case, if this is the way that we have this configured, r is u in this case. Okay. All right, so now let's go back right, right to that other equation. So we know what the answer should be for this. But if we work backwards, we do our multiplication the same way, we would get s cubed minus alpha s times the y of s equals r of s. Okay, we would just multiply this back out and we should recover the y triple dot minus alpha y single dot equals r of t. Okay, and that is exactly what we started with. Okay, so just working back and forth. Now, we did a very trivial case. These are just s's to a power. It doesn't require us to look anything up in a in a uh, inverse Laplace table. Uh, you may have something that's a little more complicated at some point that you would need to do that, and you would just pull out your table. Uh, your textbook has one in it, and you would just choose the equivalency in the time domain. Okay, but. Uh, it, and if needed, you would use partial fractions to separate things out. Uh, but yeah, that is exactly the way you would work such a problem. Okay. All right, so we work in the, tie, the uh, Laplace domain when it makes sense to with respect to transfer functions. Uh, it is really, really uh, convenient to do so because we can combine S's and, and everything like that. Uh, we avoid convolution, and that's actually one of the, the quiz questions right there, but, uh, but yeah, so that's really all there is to this. You just want to follow that technique and be consistent. All right, so the last thing that I really wanted to cover, and this is the bigger topic, is transfer functions, like an orientation, a kind of overview to them, what are their features and everything. Some of this may be a review to you. All right, so zeros, poles, characteristic equation, and standard configuration. Now let's use a little bit of our block diagram algebra, okay? I'm gonna draw out the standard configuration once more. So you'll get very familiar with this configuration. And Anytime that I do not give you, I know I've said this before, anytime I don't give you the configuration to work things out, you can assume that this is the one I mean. 
Okay, so you'll notice that we do have U of S right here. We do have E of S. Every line is now labeled. Okay, what if for this diagram, this is pretty simple, but what if I wanted to get the GCL for this? Okay. All right, so we can find that. Everything's labeled. Let's write out the equations real quick. We'll work this out. It's worth working this out one time, even though it's uh, it's simple. Okay. So we'll start at y of s. So y of s equals gp, just working backwards, operating on u of s. Okay. u of s equals gc, operating on e of s. No, we don't. We don't have to use parentheses here. E of s equals this output of this summing junction, and it is the summation of r of s with the subtraction of the feedback. So it's a negative feedback. Okay. So we now have all the equations for this system. We combine them, we get y of s equals gp gc r of s, and I'm just making that substitution real quick. We multiply this out, and we get gp, gc, r of s, minus gp, gc, y of s. Okay, just like that. All right, so I'm going to bring this whole y term over to this side, and I have y of s plus gp, gc, y of s. And that's set equal to still the GPGC R of S. Okay, so we've got all of that. All right, so now I want to factor out that Y of S. So there's nothing too terribly exciting here. Uh, this is a really trivial example of plot diagram algebra, but that's not really the goal of this problem. Once we form our output over input, I want to point out this equation. So we have GP, GC over 1 plus GP, GC. Okay? It is worth doing this example on your own at least once. Okay? So that you see this equivalency, uh, you see this transfer function, how it's developed, and you get to know this form very well. Knowing this form for the standard configuration is going to be really handy <clears throat> because we will be using this quite a bit to design controls. Okay, we are going to be moving into the second half of the semester into de uh, designing the GC component. That is a transfer function form of a control. So before we were doing things like u of t equals k1y plus k2y dot and so forth, whatever we need to. Sometimes we'd include an integral. We'd have like a k3y dt. Let's say we're doing stabilization, so we're using y's, right? Well, this, this kind of thing is representable in a transfer function format. You know, it's all we've got here are derivatives, single terms, coefficients that are constants or, or gains that we design, and integrals. So all of those things are very easily uh, represented in the Laplace domain, okay? So we have a transfer function for this control, and that is G, that is the, uh, GC. That is the compensator block. That is the control system transfer function, okay? So this GCL that we solve for has the GC built into it. It also has the one for the plant. So this guy is the plant. This guy is the control, okay? Compensator is actually what the C stands for, but uh, it really is the control transfer function. Okay, so these are a part of the closed loop system, okay? All right, so our technique is going to involve knowing what GP is in terms of transfer function and designing GC off of that we will need to use this GCL equation, okay? 
So one thing that, not to go too far into detail just yet, but one thing that we want to talk about with respect to transfer functions is the, uh, the concept of poles and zeros and what they are, okay? So normally we'll have a, let's say we have some kind of a transfer function over here. It is a function of s and it has, a, let's say, some roots on the top. Let's say a1, a2, uh, and more over here, okay? And uh, let's say the last one is uh, am. So it's uh, m on the top, m roots, that is. And on the bottom, we'll have n. Okay, so we'll say uh, b1, and um, B2, and we'll have uh, S, S plus B N. Okay, so this is nth order, and this one is nth order. So we're ta just talking about any transfer function right now. It can be GCL, it can be an equivalent block, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, let's go ahead for the sake of continuing this example and uh, we'll just talk about GCL. But say it has this structure. The roots down here, uh, negative B1, B, negative B2, da da da, negative b n these roots of the denominator down here these are actually the poles they're called poles and i'll write this out nicer in a moment on the next page these roots up here the m number of roots that you have on the top these are called zeros. Now these guys do different things. Roots are zeros. Okay. All right, so for a transfer function with a m, let's say m roots, over in roots, we have m zeros roots of numerator and in poles, and those are the roots of the denominator. Some of this I'm talking about is orientation, and you already may know this. So if we want to talk about a system, since we're like the very first thing we're interested in with a system is, is it stable or not? So with respect to, I think I, with respect to, to, <laughs> with respect to, stability, the poles are the, let's say, deciding factor. For a closed loop system. Now we can't say that they, the poles decide the system stability at all points, because what if that's just a component, okay? That component has a stability or un instability, but a system itself, it, it, the system could be stable. So if I'm just talking about the entire system as a whole, and I'm talking about the GCL transfer function, if I wanna know if it is stable or unstable, I will examine the poles, okay? All right, so, Poles. The meaning behind these will be for system stability. And 
we'll talk about that with respect to closed loop system representation, that is. Zeros, well, they also have a meaning and they do also factor in to system stability in some cases. We are gonna say zeros represent critical frequencies. So that way we can generalize it more. A zero in an open loop transfer function, because you can have a component, we talked about that, a component transfer function that can contribute to the stability of a closed loop system, okay? So if we talk about, I'm gonna point so that it's clear. If we talk about this guy's, this, this component having certain zeros and certain poles, that will contribute to closed loop stability because look here, GC actually shows up in the denominator, okay? Now I can't just say all of this is my denominator we're going to talk about why momentarily, but it does factor in, okay? at least the components of GC do. Okay, so zeros, they represent critical frequencies. Now as time goes on and we talk more about root locus and Nyquist plots, zeros are going to have a more important uh, role. Also with the Bode plots, we talk about that. Uh, these both have different effects with respect to Bode plots, and they have different effects on a root locus plot, and also with the Nyquist curves. Okay, so let's now talk about uh, so the next topic here, poles and zeros, the characteristic equation. So the characteristic equation, where is that located in a transfer function? So Let's say we have GCL of S, okay? This is a transfer function. And we're, we're still on the topic of stability. Okay, so I have this equation. Let me just write one down here. We'll say it's a third order equation. So this would be an example. And let's say that we have a A1 S squared plus A2 S cubed. Uh, S, sorry, the cubed is over here. All right, uh, A3, and then on the top, we'll have a, uh, let's say, B1S plus a B2, okay? So here is our transfer function. All right, so where is the characteristic equation? Or how is it formed? Okay, so it was very obvious once we were in the time domain that we could simply move over to the Laplace domain or use lambda representation and factor it out and find those system roots, okay? So now we have system roots on the top and we have system roots on the bottom and it's a ratio. Okay, so the characteristic equation is actually going to be the denominator. We don't have to do anything to it. It is already given to us if we have a closed loop, okay? If you have a component and you are talking about the characteristic equation of the entire system, you are going to have to go back and do a little bit of work, okay? So that is where finding this block diagram representation for the closed loop, you would have to do this for any kind of representation, okay? So this is why it's really handy to go ahead and just, just know, just work through this once, and you'll be able to recognize this form right here uh, for the standard configuration, because we will use this most of the time. So you'll be able to just go ahead and use this equation right here. And then that means that it will be trivial to go from here to forming that simplified denominator once you plug in your GC and GP, actually what they are, here the symbolic, but what your system actually is, and be able to factor that out, okay? That will be your characteristic equation. So let's do an example of that. Um, let me go ahead and complete this example right here. So the characteristic equation, 
here is s3 plus a1s squared plus a2s plus a3 equal, we set it equal to zero, okay? You can also replace these s's with lambdas. It's equivalent. So now it's a little more recognizable. It is given by the closed loop denominator. Okay, so that is with respect to system stability. So your entire system, the closed loop system, the whole thing, not a component. I'm trying to make a distinction here because there can be stability and instability of a particular component. So if we have an unstable plant, like our system that we start with, the natural system, we find the transfer function of that guy, and that transfer function is actually this GP, okay? The GP equals the plant or process transfer function. GC equals the control transfer function. We can have an unstable control. We can have an unstable plant. We can have that scenario produce a stable system. Isn't that interesting? That actually has a name and that's actually called homeopathic stability. We'll talk a bit more about that next time and I have uh, selected pages of a paper by Dr. Johnson for you, okay? That's actually a really interesting phenomenon where we can have something that is unstable and it can stabilize something that is also unstable. So uh, two wrongs making a right, so to speak. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we have the, the case of an unstable plant and an unstable control. There we go. All right, so let's let's look at an example of a uh, GCL where we have uh, something trivial as a characteristic equation. Okay. We can examine the stability. All right. So for example, let's say that we had our system. Uh, let's say it's something really easy, just a first order, something like that. And let's say that we are going to form a controlled system. So I'm going to go ahead and put that U of T on, over on the side. Okay, so I want to go to the Laplace domain and I want to get my uh, system transfer function, that is. I have S plus 1. So I would just say S and then I would uh, S times Y and then I would say y and I would factor out the y and I would get this right here. So we just did it in one step. And we have u of s right there. Okay, so now the transfer function is y of s over u of s and that is equal to 1 over s plus 1. All right, so the question is, is this a stable system? So remember, where was the characteristic equation? We're, we're going to say that this is our entire system right here. We could have used R. It really doesn't matter here. We have an input into our plant. Is our plant uh, stable? So I'll go ahead and write plant. Okay. Uh, and also we'll write GP. Okay. So is this stable? So we want to examine the characteristic equation. Okay, characteristic equation is the denominator. Okay, 
And so we would take that and we would set it equal to zero. And we would solve for s. We could replace the s with a lambda if we wanted to. But we can see easily, because it is just a trivial equation, that the system root, there's only one, it's a first order equation, is negative one. Okay? Negative one solves this equation. It's over here in the left hand plane at one. Okay? So that's stable. Anything in the left hand plane is good, stabilizes. The right hand plane is where we get our instability from. So we want to stay out of there. We definitely don't want to design to be over there. But if we see that a system is over there, we know it's unstable immediately. Any root, no matter how small, right hand plane is unstable. Okay, so we can see that we have a stable system already. Okay, well, that, that's exactly what we would be doing. We would examine that. Um, all right, uh, let's say that we had an, another example. Let's see, that, that's a, that'll be example one, this will be example two, okay? So, now, let's say I have a closed loop system, G, C, L of S, okay? So in this case, I might not want to design a control I might not need to because the system's already stable. If we're talking about system stability with uh, respect to just just the, the system as a whole. All right, so um, for this closed loop system, let's say that it isn't too more complicated. We'll say that we have a S plus one and we have a S minus two once we factor it out and then we've got maybe like an S on the top We'll make it 10. We'll have a lot of coefficient there. Okay, so same question here. Again, closed loop system. Is the entire system stable or not? We would just examine the denominator. And we can see that we do have, in this case, a root that's over in the right-hand plane. So I've got one in the left hand plane, one in the right hand plane. That means that I am going to have an unstable system, okay? However many roots you have in the right hand plane, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it's going to be unstable if you only have one, okay? So that is, again, that is the characteristic equation. That's where it comes from. Okay, so another thing that I want to go over here in motion, so I'm going to go back and refer to that uh, transfer, um, sorry, uh, Standard configuration that we were just talking about. Here we have that standard configuration. We have our transfer function representative of it. Now what you're noticing is that both the GP, when I when I make a GP for my examples, uh, GP and G cell, they also they have a numerator and a denominator. They're transfer functions themselves. These blocks, in general, they're all transfer functions. So that means that I'm going to be plugging in transfer functions into this closed loop transfer function. Okay, that means I'll probably be able to simplify it in some way. So let's take a look at that. In general, I have a GC of S, and that is going to be a polynomial on the numerator with a polynomial on the denominator. And so we'll have like uh, S plus A, one and so forth all the way to s plus a m okay. and then we'll have an s plus b one all the way to an s plus a b n okay so nth order system so i want to stick to that that n right there okay i know we're talking about gc Okay, so this n can be different from the gp's n. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so, so many variables, you know, and I end up sticking with the, <laughs> the same ones. It's kind of funny. But in, in general, what I mean is this has a system order. It, it is a subsystem. And it's going to have poles. It's going to have zeros. We're going to have the same thing happen with our gp. 
So it, it will also, let's see, it will also be a uh, polynomial over another polynomial. Okay, so instead of writing all this out every time, let me just say that I have a numerator polynomial <clears throat> and a denominator polynomial. So in general, a g of s will have a p of s over a q of s, okay? We'll just use this representation, it's very convenient. Okay, so in general, this q is going to be nth order, the roots of it are the poles. This is going to be nth order, this p and the roots of it are going to be the zeros. Okay, roots are zeros, roots are poles. Okay, so that means that my GC is going to, I know this is uh, kind of a, uh, redundant, it's going to sound that way a bit, but trust me, it is going to be useful and it is going to be worth it. So this P, we're going to have a P for a GC. We're going to have the P for a <laughs> GP, okay? So that means that GP is going to be a P of P, or P sub P, over Q sub P. And then we're also going to have this GC equals the P sub C over a Q sub C. Okay? All right. So what if I wanted to find out how my poles and zeros from each component affect my closed loop system? This is going to be an extremely important equation that you can refer back to. It's going to be useful time and time again. It's going to be useful for the last semi-link. It's going to be useful for a lot of problems doing control design from now on. We're going to derive it here, okay? So we know that GCL of S, and I'm just, I'm just referring back to this GCL of S that is the transfer function representing this whole standard configuration, okay? All right. Now when I write this, I'm, I'm you're going to write this several times. <laughs> Okay, uh, try to preserve, and, and in general, with all of these block transfer functions and everything, try to preserve the order, okay? Think of them as possibly being matrices, okay? What we're going to do here is we're going to plug in this, we're going to plug in this, and then we're going to get our characteristic equation, okay? The characteristic, I have to make this really, really clear, okay? The characteristic equation is not... 1 plus GPGC. It is the simplification of that, okay? Uh, it, it's not the simplification of just, just this denominator. It's the simplification of the denominator from this whole resulting equation, okay? Well, I will point it out at the end. Um, it is going to be uh, P sub P times P sub C plus Q sub P times Q sub C. That is what it's going to come out to. Uh, We'll see if I'm right. I should be right. <laughs> All right, so let's make our substitution, okay? We're gonna derive this this one time. It's gonna be useful. Okay, GP, uh, P sub P over Q sub P times P sub C over Q sub C. All right, one plus G sub P, which is over here again. Uh, P sub P over Q sub P. You might notice that I have dropped the of S just for space uh, and because we are going to be writing quite a bit. Uh, P sub C, Q sub C, right here. Okay, now let's do our multiplication and simplify this out. P, 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 C. I had, uh, I've had some students and, and some coworkers that laugh every time I say that. Uh, <laughs> I, I try to avoid it, but it happens sometimes. Okay, and then we've got 1 plus P sub P, P sub C, Q sub P, Q sub C. All right, and let's get a common denominator on the bottom, and then we can use the reciprocal to multiply and take care of that division. Okay, so we've got Q, P, Q, C plus the P sub P, P sub C, 
over the QPQC. Okay, now that will be same term here on the top. Just copying it forward. And then we are going to use the reciprocal of this bottom portion. Okay, so you might notice that these two terms cancel out. So we're left with this portion on the top, this numerator, and this portion here on the bottom, that's the denominator. So what do you know? I was right. Ha! Huh? Okay. <laughs> so that is uh, actually the representation of GCL for this entire standard configuration system. Now you can see how the effects of your zeros and your poles from each component, both the plant and the control system, will affect the eventual stability of your closed loop system down here. So this, this right here, this is the characteristic equation, okay? Let me write it out again. GCL of S is equal to the polynomials here divided by these polynomials added together down here, multiplied and these added together, okay? So this bottom portion, the denominator, is the characteristic equation for the closed loop system. It is not the, this, this is not every system, uh, make that really, really clear. This is the standard configuration. We are tied to the standard configuration here, okay? This will change for any system. All right, for the standard config only, you must derive it for any other system, okay? So two things I really want you to be aware of. This is useful characteristic equation is the denominator, okay? So if you want to examine the stability of a system and you want to try out a certain control transfer function, you can plug it in right here and examine the stability of that guy, of that just that denominator, okay? That's how we're going to be designing controls going forward. But, <laughs> uh, not done, things I want you to pay attention to, this is only for the standard configuration. You'll have to do that operation that I just did, deriving that, if you have something that is not the standard configuration. Okay, the other thing I'm going to emphasize, and I'm probably going to say it a couple more times uh, in this semester, is that the characteristic equation is this right here. It is not, it, um, let's see, one page back, two pages back. It is not this denominator. It never fails. I have at least one student, usually a bunch, that will plug things into this, okay, and not reduce it. This is not the characteristic equation. You must plug it all in and do the simplification that we just did, okay? All right, so again, characteristic equation. <laughs> Sorry to be so repetitive, but it, it, I, I feel like it's, it's helpful. Or, and we set it equal to zero for the standard configuration. Okay, we must derive it if we have a different system, and it is it is not one plus GPGC. have to have the Q's and P's. All right, I think that we've covered everything that we wanted to.
that's everything that I had mentioned here. Uh, the case of insufficient output, so we were going to mention, is if you ne examine, uh, I'm just going to page back a little bit and we'll just talk that through real quick. Let's say we have GC right here. I have an input over, or output over input representation. Output uh, will be, if we had output over input, we would be multiplying output by this bottom term right here, the denominator. We would be multiplying input by this top right here, okay? So it stands to reason that, say, if we have a uh, transfer function that is GC, so we have a, a U of S over, let's say, an E of S, or actually, you know what, we're going to go back and, and work with the y of s, and uh, we'll say that u of s is our input. So we have a control input, okay? This is a really good illustration right here. So we have some function of s, function of s right here, and we have another function of s on the bottom. I do that multiplication, and I go back to the time domain. What you're going to notice is that you can have u derivatives in your control equation. You can have them as inputs. You can choose to have derivatives of control be part of your control. So for example, say we have, uh, let's not do that, we'll have a minus sign right here. If we were to take this back over to the Laplace domain, we would have s plus one times y equals s minus 1 times u. I changed the sign because I didn't want these to cancel out. I, I didn't want to go into that yet. We will talk about cancellation and when it's okay and not okay to cancel. But for now, we're going to try and keep things a little bit simple. Okay, so if we wanted to get that output over input, we would end up with an s minus 1 over s plus 1. This would be our plant, okay? This is uh, going to be gp of s. And I could choose to include derivatives of my control right here. And uh, it may be good to do that, okay? The reason we would want to do that, and we'll talk about this again next uh, lecture, is that case of not being able to measure y dot, y double dot, and such. And you remember, in the first part of the semester, I kept mentioning, assume that these are measurable or uh, you know, to design your control, therefore you could include them in your control. There are cases where they are not measurable and you can't access them. And then what do you do? Well, you can choose to design your control, including derivatives. It's a little bit of a tricky way to bypass this right here. Okay. All right. So I think that's enough material for right now. Um, and you will be taking your midterm this week. So we aren't actually going to have a homework. We'll have a quick quiz just to cover this material, uh, just the new part of the material. And then we'll go from there, okay? I'll see you next time and good luck on your midterm. I wish you the best of luck. See you next time. <laughs>